All right, I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture here on Module 48. I, of course, am Mr. DeLeon, your friendly neighborhood AP Psych teacher. And uh, I'm excited to be trying this flipped lesson here. Uh, again, just some uh, tips as you watch this video. Uh, if you have questions about some of the terms, some of the concepts, be sure to jot those down. Uh, we will be spending the first several minutes of Friday's class uh, doing some questions and answers about any of the topics that you saw here. Let's start with uh, explaining our learning targets for the next few moments here. We are going to uh, share with you information about the uh, social development of a child. I know up to this point we've primarily been focusing on the physical and the cognitive development, uh, but today we're going to look at some of those key factors involved in the social development relationships. We're also going to look at the role of parents in parenting styles and how those can impact a child's development. Let's start with a pretty important term, uh, a term here uh, that uh, is called a critical period. Throughout our lives we will experience various critical periods. These are times when certain internal and external influences have a major impact on our development. During our childhood, there are many critical periods. One of those critical periods involves the topic we are covering today, the importance of the establishment of a social relationship with a parent or a caregiver. Uh, it is vital that that happens here at this stage uh, because we know the impacts of that can be carried throughout the rest of one's development. Uh, so this stage that we're talking about, the social development of a child, extremely critical. We're going to start today also by looking here at the idea of attachment. This is the strong and long-lasting emotional tie that we experience between humans. We are talking today about the parent-child relationship primarily, so looking at that strong emotional tie between a parent and a child. This is also a good time to bring up the concept of stranger anxiety. This is a phenomena that we notice uh, developing around eight months of age. As babies uh, have become familiar with their caregivers and the appearance of their caregivers, they have actually created a schema. Remember that term from Piaget. A concept of what a caregiver should be. Providing them food, protection, warmth things of that nature. So they have gotten used to the appearance of their caregiver, usually a parent. So when a new face comes into the uh, schema here, they cannot assimilate that and it causes some anxiety. You've heard the phrase stranger danger. Part of that is tied into this. It's a natural phenomena that occurs. Another key factor in promoting this attachment is the issue of body contact, touch. We looked at this actually back in Unit 8 when we studied Harlow's famous uh, experiment with these baby monkeys who had been separated from their mothers at birth and were presented with one of two surrogate mothers. Remember there was one mother who was made out of hard, cold wire uh, cold to the touch, but this mother happened to have food. The other mother was soft, warm, fuzzy, and furry, but had no food. If you remember, when these babies were startled, more often than not, they preferred to cling to the soft, warm mother, even though she did not have food. This emphasized the importance of touch in establishing con uh, attachment. Another concept that goes along the lines of, of attachment, but it's more primitive, that is, it doesn't have that same emotional connection as attachment, is the idea of imprinting. Imprinting is a form of primitive bonding that takes place between a baby and its source of nourishment and protection. Once again, this is usually apparent, but it doesn't always have to be that way. In the case of Conrad Lawrence, who you see a picture of here, uh, and his ducklings, uh, it's a good illustration of how organisms can imprint, that is, they can connect with anything or anyone 
that provides them nourishment and protection. Here's a picture of Lawrence swimming in a pond, and these ducklings who connected with him uh, end up following him as if he were their mother. There are other pictures of him where these ducks would be walking in a straight line behind him, again, as if he were their mother. I saw a video on YouTube not too long ago, a story of a dog, in this case a golden retriever, that had actually taken in some baby tiger cubs who had been abandoned by their mother and provided nourishment to these cubs. Uh, a form of imprinting had occurred. These tiger cubs, because their real mother had rejected them, clung on to this golden retriever. And it was interesting that the golden retriever basically treated them uh, as one of her own. Now, it'll be interesting to see how this relationship progresses when these baby tigers get old enough to eat the uh, golden retriever. Uh, we'll see uh, how that turns out. The next concept we want to look at here is the idea of attachment, and in particular, um, the types of attachment. A very famous study that you need to know here was conducted by Mary Ainsworth. It was entitled The Strange Situation Study. Back in 1977, what she did was she took in pairs of mothers and their children and observed them in a playroom under one of four conditions. Uh, first off, just observing their initial interaction. How did the baby and the mother seem to get along? Then she would have the mother leave the infant alone in the playroom. Then a stranger would enter the room and begin to interact with the child. The mother would then return and begin more interactions with the child. What Ainsworth noted were one of two forms of attachment. First, we have the securely attached. These were the children who, when the mother was present, felt confident uh, in their ability to explore the room, to try new toys. When the mother left, they became upset and a little more reserved. They did not explore as much as when the mother was present. So the presence of the mother created a sense of confidence, if you will, in these children. She also noticed that some children had a form of insecure attachment. These were children who were less likely to explore when the mother was present. They were a little more clingy, a little more anxious. Uh, even when the mother attempted to uh, comfort them, they would often avoid or ignore the mother's attempts. Uh, they remained distressed despite the presence of the mother. So this was a form of insecure attachment. Another concept here that we look at here when we're talking about attachment and attachment differences is the idea of temperament. Think of temperament as our baby personality. It's the way we carry ourselves physically and emotionally uh, and it starts at an early age. Two other famous researchers, Thomas and Chess here, did some studies about some different types of temperament. Uh, starting with an easy baby. This was a baby who perhaps uh, had a very uh, predictable routine, uh, very easy going. They were not agitated or irritated very easily. The opposite would be our difficult babies. These were babies who never really settle into routine and seem to be easily agitated uh, and were not easy to pacify as well. Then you had kind of an in-between, a slow to warm up, and then shy babies. You can read more about these specific types of temperaments uh, in Module 48. Another concept worth looking at here when we talk about the parent-child relationship is Eric Erickson's basic trust. We are going to do much more with Erickson's Theory. He had eight stages of social development, but we're going to key on here the first stage that he called trust versus mistrust. What he noted that early on, again, it's important that an infant receives consistent care, uh, typically from the same individual, the parental figure. When they receive this on a consistent basis, that, that helps them develop a sense of trust. When they have this trust, they feel more free, more confident to explore their surroundings. They feel more independent. Uh, secure attachment also plays a role here, which helps lead to that sense of greater 
autonomy. So that relationship, again, between a parent and a child is extremely important. Another factor that plays a key role in the parent-child relationship is the style of parenting that a parent chooses to employ when interacting with their child. Diana Baumrind is the name to know here, and she came up with four uh, different styles of parenting. So let me take you through those real quick. We're going to start with what Baumrind called the authoritarian. When you think of authoritarian, think of dictator-like. Oftentimes when we describe governments and political systems that are dictatorships, we also call them authoritarian systems. These are parents who control behavior very rigidly, very firm. They are very quick to use punishment and stress authority and unquestioning obedience. These are the parents, when you ask them, why do I have to do this? They are likely to say, and you could probably guess it, because I said so. That's all you need to know. It's either my way or the highway. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the permissive parents. And there's two types of permissive parents. There's a permissive indifferent. When someone's indifferent about something, it's almost as if they don't really care. A permissive indifferent parent is going to be the most tolerant, least likely to use discipline, not really have any expectations, and not controlling at all. It's almost borderline neglectful. So when you think of authoritarian as dictator-like, permissive indifferent is almost like anarchy, the absence of any government. Now we have permissive indulgent as well. These are parents that are involved. They're very attentive, very supportive to their children. But because they do not set limits on behavior, they also fall into this permissive category. These are parents who don't set guidelines, don't set expectations, but at the same time indulge their children with gifts, attention, uh, all kinds of support. Uh, and it's another extreme here, but in this case, the permissive indulgent. Somewhere in the middle, you have what we call the authoritative parent. These are parents who do have structure, do have guidelines. They offer guidance, but at the same time, they're not too controlling. These are parents who like to use the R word, and by that I mean responsibility and rational thinking. So these are the parents who are more likely to drop the word disappointment. For example, when their child misbehaves, they are not going to be quick to spank or quick to come down firm like an authoritarian parent. These will be the parents who say, it's not so much that you broke the rule, although that's important, it's that you have disappointed us in your lack of responsibility. Sound familiar? That's the authoritative parent. Now, Baumrand also concluded that these different parenting styles can have various impacts on the child's personality and behavior. For example, she argued someone who's an authoritarian parent might produce children who are withdrawn and distrustful, mainly because they're not used to doing things on their own. They are dependent upon a parent to tell them what to do, when to do it, how to do it. So when they're given an opportunity for free thinking or behavior on their own, they tend to be more withdrawn. Permissive indifferent Parents may produce children who are over-dependent and also lack self-control, mainly because they've never been given guidelines. They've never been told, here's what you can and cannot do. Permissive indulgent parents may tend to produce children who are immature, impulsive, and also lacking in self-control. These parents may also inadvertently, perhaps, produce children who have a sense of entitlement. For example, they feel like they deserve gifts, they deserve attention because that's what they've always been used to. Authoritative parents tend to produce children who are self-reliant and socially responsible. They've been given boundaries, but they've also been given the freedom to test and prove their responsibility. So, when off on their own, they tend to be more uh, self-reliant and socially responsible. 
Now, this brings up another issue. Remember, we talked about several of our enduring issues here in developmental psychology. Nature versus nurture when it comes to parenting. The previous slide showed how perhaps a parent's ability or lack of can impact the development of a child. That, of course, would be an environmental influence. But is that always the case? Will kids just be kids no matter what type of parent is involved? For example, I have a concept of the type of parent I want to be. But what if one of my children behaves in a way that is not allowing me to be that style? What has more of an influence, nature versus nurture? Of course, by now we know the answer to that question, which is both play a role. So, sorry to say, we can't blame everything on our parents. Uh, some of that is, uh, of course, of our own doing. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video lecture. Uh, feel free, of course, to, uh, to ask questions first thing tomorrow in class. Uh, in class tomorrow, we'll be doing more work with these concepts to help promote your understanding. Thank you.